Hello and welcome to another edition of Door County Today. I'm your host, Paul Renier of Door County Nature and Travel. Winter in Door County is incredibly beautiful. The parks are perfect for snowshoeing, a great sport we'll explore later in the show. In the meantime, let's visit Scrimshanders in the Green Gable Shops in Ephraim, where Scrimshaw is preserved as a living art. Later, we'll meet Eric Lewis, a musician with deep county roots, and go to Washington Island for a tour of Seaver's School of Fiber Arts. Let's begin with Scrimshanders. Gary, uh, who is my husband and our resident Scrimshander, has an older brother, Daniel, who moved out east as a young man and became fascinated with the folk art of Scrimshaw, which is the folk art of engraving on ivory. And so Dan started doing Scrimshaw, opened his own store in Faneuil Hall, the Boston Scrimshanders, but he needed help. So one night he taught Gary how to Scrimshaw, and Gary started supplying Dan at the Boston Scrimshanders. We opened a store on Mackinac Island, but when our kids started uh, high school, we decided that we needed to move off the island and we opened Scrimshanders in Door County in Ephraim. We've been here since 1993 and we're continuing both locations into our 33rd year. Scrimshaw is very much a New England folk art or at least we like to think so. Obviously this art form was being done a lot of other places around the world but not called Scrimshaw. The term Scrimshaw didn't come up until the American whalers started producing this little scratching on bone and ivory and, and started the art form itself. This is the first time where somebody took a raw piece of ivory, turned it into a canvas, and the only real artwork done to it was the engraved line with the picture showing up. This was a unique thing that had never been done before. Obviously in their, their era, these guys either used whale bone, whale's teeth. Occasionally they were actually traded as they moved to the Pacific they would trade with Eskimos and get walrus tusks. We've just purchased about, I would say maybe um, 30 pounds of raw material uh, from a guy up in Alaska who um, buys it raw up there. The other material we can bring into the country is mammoth ivory. And this is just a chunk of mammoth tusk. We can take a piece like this. We can, in some cases, I actually take a screwdriver or what have you and pry it and knock off a section and work with that section. You can almost see how I would take that section and slice it. Gary and Rudy sit and clean it up and polish it and sand it down. Sometimes we will cut into and make a window into this, get down into the light to where it'll look like a frame on the outside with the bark and then lighter on the interior. Most New England scrimshanders are very much purists in that they like scrimshaw to be nautical in motif because it was the whalers doing it, and they like it to be one color, a monotone, because originally it was. The further west you go, the more color you can get away with and the more different uh, artist styles. You can do more shading techniques. It's not just straight line scrimshaw. It's stippling and it's cross hatching, and you can do all those things and be a little more refined being in the Midwest. I still have purists come into our store and they prefer the black nautical scrimshaw and we have lots of that because many of my scrimshanders are New England scrimshanders yet to this day. This is the tool I use. They refer to it as a dental burr. It's carbide tip but you can actually see the burr portion out at the end. I then will take that, put it into a Dremel tool, get it spinning. Use these modern day diamond files to hone it down into the sharp point or sharp tip that I would like. I then install that bit into my drafting pin. There's nothing more than a yeah. And that's what I use to sit and engrave. When I'm working on a piece like this, I get the, I then just end up taking the surface area, begin scratching, you can come back and make fine-tuned little lines. Again, so much uh, more pleasant environment to work in than what the whalers had when they were uh, out at sea. In our Door County store, we have expanded our artists beyond Scrimshaw. So we have a lot of artisans like woodcarvers, potters, 
basket weavers, Nantucket baskets, and also different ivory carvers, and a lot of knives. We have both production knives and custom knives. And the production knives we buy, which are already made, and many of them already have a white bone handle. Sometimes we'll even take a production knife and take off the handles, cut ivory handles to put on, or bone handles to put on it, and then engrave it in scrimshaw. And then it's a unique one-of-a-kind knife, very special. In our Door County shop, we have kind of done a focus to a more masculine, and scrimshaw is a masculine art. Most of my scrimshanders are men, and most of my basket weavers are men. So it is very much of a, a manly art. And thus, we have found a little niche, particularly with our knives, because there aren't a lot of places that sell nice, fine knives, quality knives, different knives, knives you can't find anyplace else. And that has really brought in a nice customer base of guys. So that's our theme sometimes, guy shopping. Welcome to another segment of The Natural Door. I'm Paul Renier with Door County Nature and Travel, and today we're going to be snowshoeing. A very common and popular winter activity, and one that you can enjoy. Snowshoeing is easy, it's not very expensive, and it's a great way to enjoy Door County in winter. But first, let's take a look at a little bit of technology and through the ages for snowshoes. I have an older style snowshoe dating back to the 30s or 40s, uh, considered to be appropriate technology at the time, worked great, made of more natural materials from the wood ash frame, rawhide webbing, and leather straps. But if we were to compare these to the original snowshoes dating back to about 6,000 years ago in an area that's now called Asia, these would be considered high tech. If you were to go to a rental store, a sports store, and look for snowshoes, generally you'll see something very similar to this. This is a modern snowshoe with the aluminum frame, the synthetic decking, and also the, the more high-tech um, bindings. These have been available for almost 30 years, and they continue to evolve. They're generally much smaller than the snowshoes, the traditional snowshoes. They have a solid decking versus having the web decking. A big difference between the traditional snowshoes and the modern snowshoes is found on the bottom where we have these little structures, these little crampon structures made up of aluminum. They can be kind of sharp and it's not good to go walking across wooden floors with this. But these features are actually, can be considered a safety feature for when you're walking on ice or crusty snow or perhaps when you're climbing up a, a slope or on a mountain. Once you have your equipment, then it's a matter of tweaking a few little things, mittens, you know, a coat. Um, I like to wear a, uh, a windbreaker or some type of uh, snow pants that will keep the snow off you and keep you dry. Um, obviously a good pair of boots would be helpful, but pretty much most people have those things in their homes. If you're living in the North Country and if you've been in winter, you have most of the equipment you need. Quite often people like to bring, and I recommend people bring, uh, use, uh, ski poles or poles that you use for trekking along with you for your first time out it's a great tool to have helps to maintain your balance and makes you a little bit more comfortable as we walk on top of the ridge tops where the trails are located every once in a while we'll come across a bridge which crosses over the wetlands or the swales of the ridges this pattern repeats itself a number of times from ridge top to swale to ridge top the bridges will indicate that it's usually wet. Sometimes, like during the winter, it's frozen, or during dry spells, it's pretty dry. But for the most part, if you come here in the spring, the swales will be teeming with wildlife, uh, frogs, sometimes little minnows, plants are growing and emerging, and also in some places, trees are growing, because some of these swales, being as old as they are, are starting to fill in. Here's a great example of a swale. We're in a wetland right now. It's an area between two ridges. 
of a species of tree that grows and loves to have their feet wet, and that's the black ash. This is a little miniature black ash swamp. This is a deciduous tree, which contrasts our conifers that we see, the white spruce and the balsam firs, and they are growing in a niche that the other trees aren't quite ready to grow in. Eventually this swale will dry up and other trees like the balsam firs and the white spruce will move into it. But right now it's perfect for the black ash. They love it and they're growing here and doing fine. Another feature you'll find anywhere in Dora County, 365 days a year, are spring holes. Spring holes pop up all over the place. If you look hard enough, you'll find spring holes, usually associated with wetlands, but the spring holes will have open water, uh, little puddles here and there, providing a wonderful source of water for birds and wildlife in winter. Many of these spring holes start maybe 100 yards, maybe 200 yards, could be a mile away, where pressure on the landscape pushes water someplace else, moving along the plains of the dolomitic limestone and emerging on the surface as we see here. Thank you for joining us on another segment of The Natural Door. For more information about Door County and its beautiful natural features, visit www.doorcountytoday.com. Thank you and we'll see you next time. It all starts with my grandfather and my mother. Actually, my um, grandfather was a banjo player in East Tennessee. Um, and my mom, she plays guitar and sings, and she writes her own songs, mostly country, uh, in the style, I would say, of like Hank Williams Sr. Uh, everything she writes is probably from the, sounds like it could have been written in the 40s or the 50s. But um, I, I grew up listening to music in the house all the time and um, hearing my grandfather and my mother play together around the house or at the nursing home when we went to visit him. And um, so one day, uh, I mean, my mother, when I was growing up, um, she was always singing around the house and singing in the kitchen while I was getting ready for school and I always heard, hey, good looking, what you got cooking? You know, which is a great song to be singing when you're cooking in the kitchen. And, uh, you know, I didn't think much of it at the time, being a, a youngster, but it made an impact on me later on. We uh, would go visit my grandfather in the nursing home, and they would sit around and play guitar and banjo, and mostly bluegrass and old-time country. And when I was about 11 or 12, I didn't much care for that kind of thing. You know, I wanted to hear ACDC and Van Halen and Ozzy Osbourne, to be honest. And um, one day this orderly walked in the room and he said, hey, can I see your guitar? Mom said, sure. Hand him the guitar and he played a few chords on it and it was just like the pyros had gone off and, you know, the lights were down and the, it was just unbelievable. I was like, you can do that on a guitar that's what I want to do. So it took about a year and uh, my mother finally, after a few piano lessons, uh, I convinced her that I wanted to play guitar. And uh, so we got a guitar and I started taking some lessons from the orderly for about a year and a half or two years. And, <laughs> and one day I came to a lesson and he said that he couldn't teach me anymore because I was starting to learn things on my own that he couldn't even figure out. So I uh, first was in basically hard rock bands in junior high and high school, all the way to my mid-twenties, really. And yeah, oh yeah, long hair, I still have the tattoos. The band I was in that just came out on Sony Red oh. from 20 years ago, uh, a former girlfriend's lips and a, a Telecaster burning in flames. It's a mar I'm marked forever from that time period. I'll never forget it, you know. 
it may not mean as much now, but sometimes it means even more. I don't know, but it just adds a little mystery. Yeah, you know, I played trumpet all through high school and um, took classical guitar lessons and studied jazz. And I was in a band with this a guy named Chris Scott. It's just he and I playing acoustic guitars, and he had a lap steel that had been in his family. He said, of all the people I know, Eric, you could probably make something out of this thing. So I bought some strings and started teaching myself, which eventually led to the pedal steel guitar and, um, and dobro and various things like that. And one night we were playing that gig, and Andy Ratliff showed up, and he said, hey, you know, you're, you're pretty good on guitar. Um, have you ever thought about playing bluegrass? I said, well, you know, my mom used to play a lot of bluegrass when I was growing up. I've never really thought about it. He said, well, I play mandolin and fiddle and banjo. And I was like, you do? Bam, we became a, a brother duet. I have a crazy past. I'm a, I'm a rock and roller. I'm a, I'm a jazzer. I'm, blues guy. I'm influenced by anything good. I just love music. I love blues, country, jazz, western swing, bluegrass. Did I say bluegrass? Country. I mean, God, it just goes on and on. I, I like everything and um, I like variety. I just love to play music and if it's good, I, I, I get influenced by it. I'm more of an instrumentalist and music writer than, uh, say, lyrics are concerned, but uh, I do write songs from time to time, but it's been one of those things that a lot of times you feel like you're revealing yourself and it's like, I don't know, going to church without any clothes on and it's a little too scary, so I don't always open up enough to perform original lyrics anymore, but I think I'm getting braver as the years go on. Young and uh, my husband and I are owners here at Seaver School. We've been owners since 1987 and Seaver School is located on Washington Island. We're on the Jackson Harbor Road. The signage says we're 6.8 miles from the ferry dock landing. Seaver School was started in 1979. It was started as an idea of a gentleman who retired to Washington Island. His wife was a weaver. Walter designed a weaving loom and when he started to market it, he needed a name for the business and he chose his wife Sophie's maiden name, which was Seavers. The students that come each year and this year's enrollment is at, uh, it's just gone over 450. So we have a very high rate of return. Uh, they're adults. They're interested in what we teach, which is fiber arts. So they're either as a beginner or an intermediate uh, artist who wants to learn more about surface design or knitting or weaving. And because we teach a lot of beginner classes, uh, you know, people like to come to, to learn how. If we had a mission statement for them, it would be something like uh, uh, come to a beautiful place where you can relax. Um, Doing something nice for yourself is something I think a lot of gals don't take time for, so that's important. And um, if they belong to a group or something back home where they don't have enough time to quilt or weave or something like that, this is a place that they can do it. In the weaving classes, we would have basic weaving for people just getting started. And oftentimes the next year, there would be a beyond beginning. Um, 
It could be a lace weave class, it could be a rug weaving class, it could be in basketry, it could be basic basketry or pine needle, independent study, uh, quilting, again beginner level, but going beyond to quilt design or machine quilting. Lots of surface design, batiking, silk screening, that type of thing. The teachers that we have this year number about 45. The one gal that comes to mind first of all is a lady from Green Bay. Her name is Mary Sue Fenner. She's a weaving instructor but she lends herself toward garments. She is the one teacher we've had that has been here every single year for 33 years and I think that's quite an accomplishment. Yep. Well, my name is Carolyn Foss, and uh, I've worked at Seaver since 1990 in the office. There's three of us that work here year-round. And so we all do a lot of different jobs, uh, but um, it keeps us busy uh, all through the year. So. And I have taken a number of weaving classes, uh, although I consider myself a beginner each time I do it. But I uh, certainly enjoy demonstrating for visitors that come in the shop. So This is a loom that Walter Schutz, the founder of Seavers Design, uh, which we um, sell as kits uh, for people to put together. They are also used in our weaving classes. Um, and what I'm uh, working on is just a plain weave uh, piece used to demonstrate to people coming into the shops. I'm just starting a simple twill. And, uh, if you have a very complicated pattern, um, you write it down and that helps keep your place. What I'm doing is something that I can remember. Just a repeat of four different um, treadling sequences. So. The consignment shop has maybe 130 different uh, students and teachers work. Um, many fiber arts things, but we also have um, items that they've made that are not fiber related, but as long as they've been a student or teacher here, then um, their work is welcome in the shop. So. It's, it's just a wonderful way to um, show their work and the accomplishments they've made, as well as inform the visitors that we have as to what a fiber art is, uh, what fiber art is about. Thanks for joining us today. Remember to come back often to find out more about Door County's history, landscapes, businesses, and people. I'm Paul Renier for Door County Today. See you next time.